I'm very happy. I'm very happy to be in a home that loves me. Coming to work gives me joy and happiness. Yeah, it's really good, yeah. I like doing stuff. I like doing art. And I've been with the art teacher for 10, 10 years. Kind of wiggly lines, yes, look at that. Not so long ago, people like Ed, Michael, and Jane would have very different lives. And some of these children wouldn't be here. But things changed. And the way they changed is proof that big things... You're just like, oh my God, oh my God. It was just so powerful. That was a radical thought to many. Really big things can start small. That's what it takes sometimes when the task is impossible. In the late 1800s, the new province of British Columbia shared an attitude with the rest of the country and most of the Western world. That the so-called feeble-minded were the cause of much of society's ills. The feeble-minded can be divided into idiots, Mongolian imbeciles, imbeciles, and morons, and have contributed greatly to criminality, vice, and pauperism. The solution seemed obvious. Lock them away. And in 1878, BC's Asylum for the Insane opened in New Westminster. A mix of the mentally ill and people with intellectual disabilities, it was almost immediately overcrowded and had a shocking mortality rate. Over the years, it would grow exponentially. Those deemed mentally ill would be moved elsewhere. And the name would change to Woodlands. But one thing remained constant. Conditions were terrible. It was a harsh environment. You walk through the gate. And it's almost like you walk into a forbidden world. Different rules apply. It's not the same. Nothing is the same. I remember going to Woodlands when I was a kid. We visited it once a week. When my little sister Barbara was born, she did have a developmental disability, although it wasn't called that at the time. She ended up going to, to Woodlands. My parents felt they had no other options. It wasn't easy. I mean, that was a long time ago, but already I'm feeling like I'm going to cry. You know, I mean, because it was such an awful thing to have to do as a family. Mom and I would go to visit her. I think it was a Wednesday. Every Wednesday. It was eerie. Hundreds of people, small rooms. Some of them were like cells. And I remember people screaming when we would be walking out, my mom and I, or my parents and I, saying, take me home, take me home. Most had no visitors or a home to go back to. 
families were usually advised to forget they ever existed. At doctors' recommendations, babies are dropped off, often just abandoned at the gate, and kept in wards of 50 with just a single nurse. For the adults, things are no better. I think back to the day room. The window is really, really high, really close to the ceiling. You can't tell what's going on outside. You can tell if it's cloudy, if it's dark, if it's sunny out. But you don't get to look out the window. And you would have people just sitting in a chair around the perimeter of the room. That's it. Nothing. Day after day after day, hour after hour after hour, you can understand why people just shut down. So you try to do some sort of engagement, but then it becomes a matter of people need to be clean, toileted, fed, clean, toileted, fed, clean, toileted, fed, as efficiently as possible. And it is, it's dehumanizing in many ways because people are not cattle, right? People deserve to be treated with some humanity and kindness and individuality. It's about thinking of them as less of a human being. Abuse is widespread, hidden behind a code of silence. In my era, which is at the I would like to say at the beginning of the era of, if you see, you tell. You see abuse, you report it. You know of abuse, you report it. If you think there's abuse, you report it. But you have that status quo of, I don't see, I don't tell. Nobody says anything. So there were many predators that came into Woodlands, yes, but it goes further than that. An inquiry would ultimately uncover the full extent of it. There's been horrific abuse. The environment breeds it. There is a dehumanizing factor there. But for much of the 20th century, the population at places like Woodlands just kept growing, fueled by the increasing influence of something called eugenics. Eugenics claim that simple genetics determined almost everything. And that society could be uplifted and the human race improved through selective breeding. The pseudoscience favored the white and privileged and advocated purging society of those it considered genetically inferior, including the so-called feeble-minded. So more and more are locked away. And in 1933, BC passes the Sexual Sterilization Act, making the forced sterilization of, quote, mental defectives believed to be at risk of reproducing legal. Denied basic human rights. Locked up in inhumane conditions. Abandoned. Forgotten. And then, in 1938, a strong-willed telephone operator gives birth to a boy named Bobby. My little brother, he was born with Down syndrome, and my mother was told that this is a condition that we don't have a, an answer for. And the real answer that we recommend would be to institutionalize them out at uh, Woodlands in Westminster. She didn't want that to happen. B. Purdy had other ideas. My mother wanted Bobby to be healthy and happy. That's the least he could expect out of life certainly not institutionalized. I mean, that place was a jailhouse. 
And I can't imagine what went on in there, but I'm sure it was unpleasant. She sure thought it was. She wouldn't even think about it. Uh, so that motivated her to roll up her sleeves and make something happen. Not institutionalizing was an uncommon choice, but there had to be others. She found several parents who were also parents of children with disabilities. I don't know how she did it. I don't know how she located these people. There wasn't any networks. There weren't any social media going on. And uh, so I guess she just asked around. And then, you know, somebody says, well, I know somebody who's got a child like that. You know, one thing led to another. And so she got about 12 people together. And then she used our house as a meeting place for them to discuss what they were going through and what they would hope to have happen. Together, they formed what would one day become the Developmental Disabilities Association, with Be Pretty as president and with the goal of educating their children. They started small in church basements with the parents themselves doing the teaching. I guess it was a lot of trial and error, frankly, because it never been done before, so. And B got busy fundraising. She would try to see who might be sympathetic. She would ask and try to network. There were successes, but it was an uphill battle. I mean, this was a time where you put them out of sight, forgot they were there. Oubliette. I mean, I remember when we were little and I was walking around town, my little brother would get a reaction from people. It just was this repulsion, you know. He just did that. And, and uh, you're a little guy, you know, you feel all those things a lot. I think it was just ignorance and fear of the unknown, you know. So I'm going to ignore it or cross the street or turn my back or shut my eyes. Despite the prejudices, B kept at it, learning as she went. She didn't have any preparation. My mother went to high school and then went to work. She didn't have big time education. She didn't have any sophisticated experiences, didn't travel, didn't do any of those things. She was thoughtful, she was kind, she was sensitive to people, and she was not going to give up. That's what it takes sometimes when the task is impossible. The impossible task? Getting a proper school built like other kids had. Because not only would it take a lot of money, the law would have to be changed. Only children deemed educatable had the legal right to schooling, and Bobby and the others didn't qualify. So B reinvented herself as a lobbyist. That's what she did. That's all she did. I mean, aside from working for the telephone company and trying to keep bread on the table and sewing dresses at 2 o'clock in the morning so she looked good for the people in Victoria. My mother would go over to Victoria and, you know, try to get the minister in charge to listen. You know, a woman challenging the male world over there and getting kind of rebuffed or patronized, those sort of things. Treating her with disdain, you know, because she was a woman. That's her saying it. But I mean, I guess it's just life. And she was determined and she was tenacious. She had to be. It's not politically sexy, you know. I'd rather do something else with the taxpayer's money. So she had a lot of struggles, but she wouldn't take no for an answer, and you knew she wasn't going anywhere. It paid off. The laws were changed, allowing quote-unquote retarded children to be educated using public money. And when the association opened their Oak Ridge School in 1961, it was the first of its kind anywhere in the country. She did the impossible. Unprecedented. 
the Oak Ridge School opened up whole new worlds. I loved school. I really loved school. You know, I couldn't get enough of it. Just being there, just being there. I had home at PE, and the music class we had was so good. It wasn't academic. Education in terms of life skills, I don't think education in terms of how to, you know, do a physics problem. You know, you bring them along, you do, you, you get the most you can out of what you got. They all have different needs and capabilities with which they have to work. It's a big job, but they're not just people with a handicap, they're people. It's an approach a million miles away from Woodlands. I really liked the teachers. They were good, they were really good. Teaching methods evolved as discoveries were made. You know, it's trial and error, stumble and bump, and uh, eventually uh, get traction. And the school offered something that most kids take for granted. It was social and made friends with other kids. I loved Oak Ridge School. It was a far cry from a church basement. And as that first generation of children from those early basement classes became young adults, the association kept dreaming big. What if they and others could hold down jobs, become productive members of society? Initial forays into vocational training were promising and followed by the establishment of an occupational center or sheltered workshop known as VARCO. My first job was at VARCO. I didn't know what to expect. I couldn't sleep the night before. <laughs> and I mean, okay, why am I not falling asleep? Oh, I think I know why. Because of my first job. And it was really <laughs> something. I mean, wow. There was mainly contracts, different kinds of contracts. Forward-thinking businesses were discovering a new workforce, and lessons were being learned about what it means to work. We had to concentrate on what we're working on. And what work can mean. It was good. It was good. You know, my first paying job. Really, really good. I couldn't wait to go to work. As progressive new ideas like VARCO were taking shape at the association, cracks were beginning to show in some old ideas. Eugenics had been largely discredited. The Nazis had used eugenics in their attempts to rationalize the Holocaust and the mass murder of millions of others, including people with disabilities. The inhumanity of it had shocked the world. The scientific community had recognized that we are all more complicated than eugenics and its baked-in prejudices could account for. But still, the idea that the so-called retarded had potential remained a radical notion. And in BC, the institutions kept growing. In 1958, another one had been added to deal with overcrowding. Even so, a growing minority of parents are following B. Purdy's lead by bucking the system and refusing to institutionalize their children. The Evolving Association's new preschool gives them someplace to go. The Oak Ridge School gets a kindergarten class, and a children's hostel is built to provide temporary respite for families. 
But the real cutting edge is now out at UBC. University of British Columbia is one of the continent's leading universities. In the mid-1960s, the association partners with the Department of Education on a groundbreaking pilot program using a daycare setting to explore the development of neurodiverse three to five-year-olds. And then, in 1969, a girl named Pamela Vickers is born. The doctor came in and he told me that Pamela was born with Down syndrome. There are more than 50 known characteristics associated with Down syndrome, formerly called Mongolism. But retarded mental development is nearly always found. I really felt sorry for myself. I mean, I just sort of, I think I cried all night and I woke up the next morning and thought, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm just feeling sorry for myself and get over it, right? I mean, she's a baby and let's, let's carry on. The sooner parents have the necessary information, the better are their chances to accept a situation they can only consider a personal disaster. The physician must make a recommendation concerning the care of the child Rejecting a doctor's suggestion that Pamela be institutionalized, Pat and her husband found themselves largely on their own, in a vacuum. There was not very much information available and very little support. It was a question of trying to find something. <laughs> That's how I got involved with the association. It was very important that I meet another mother and through the association I was able to meet another mother who had a little girl who had Down syndrome and then from there she told me about the preschool running out of UBC and I went out there to see the children in the preschool and that is, was so helpful but the trailblazing research and support coming out of the association's partnership with UBC was focused on three to five-year-olds, leaving parents of newborns and infants, like Pat and her husband, at a loss. So we formed a committee and decided that maybe, maybe we needed a program for the under threes. The driving force was parents, no question about it. After a few years of development and fundraising, an ad appears in the paper. I answered an advertisement in the Vancouver Sun. They were hiring someone to work in a new program with children with disabilities. I had been teaching, and this looked like an interesting opportunity. I was completely unqualified. Uh, you probably couldn't find anyone less qualified than I was at that time, and I was very open about that during the interview. And in fact, that subsequently, I was told that it was my honesty uh, in that regard, that, that I, I demonstrated that I was open to learning because this was not a field I knew. Dana Brynelson didn't really know anything about infants with developmental disabilities. But it turned out no one else really did either anywhere. The goal with a program to help parents understand more about their child's development and learn ways that they could encourage their child's development. But at the time I was hired, there was very little information available on infant development. There had been a book published which was uh, about four inches uh, thick called The Complete Infant. And in that, they had, they had amassed all the research to date on infant development. There are millions and millions and millions of pages of research since that time. But at that time, they felt they could put everything they knew about infant development uh, into a single, a single volume. And the extremely tiny amount of research focused on infants with developmental disabilities had been done at institutions similar to Woodland's and had unsurprisingly concluded that such infants had limited potential. In institutional settings, you don't provide stimulation or encouragement or a loving, nurturing environment or an interesting environment. So the information that we get from those settings is very restrictive in terms of potential. Tapping into what limited, relevant research there was, 
Dana and a small team begin refining what the association called the Vancouver Infant Program, figuring out ways to make it work best. We didn't have any tools initially to do this, tools in the sense of approaches that, that would be helpful. We had to create them. Every parent wants the best possible chance for their baby to have a good start in life. You, the parents, play a critical and rewarding role in this. The key was the early recognition of the parent as the expert in their child's development. The program was home-based to keep it accessible and keep parents in the driver's seat. I had a caseload of 13 families, and this was the first home-based infant program in Canada, incorporating our suggestions into the everyday life of the family. Developmental assessments are provided. Program consultants may be called upon as needed. Developmentally appropriate exercises are suggested during home visits and parents are encouraged to integrate them into regular activities. The parent is feeding and dressing and playing and uh, exposing the child to language and to other activities that the family are engaged in. Each and every one of those activities is, a, is of course, a learning opportunity. But the more traditional professional expert model was challenged by this, hugely challenged, because it was felt that really that it was up to the expert to provide intervention for the infant and young child, not the parent. So that was a radical uh, thought to many. And it wasn't the only idea considered radical. Our model believed very strongly that if parents had a concern about their child, that this was enough to offer this service to them, rather than a diagnosis by a physician and then a referral by the physician. We opened the door. And we received a great deal of concern about that from the medical profession in particular. Yes, they were very concerned. Over time, we were able to demonstrate with statistics and the experiences of physicians who were connected to our program that the benefits really were huge. But for some, even that was not enough. I had a conversation with a physician, a senior physician. He said that the infant program was great. He referred to it, he thought it was a wonderful program. He had nothing but praise for it but that it was far too good to be wasted on children with uh, disability. That this was a program that should be reserved for uh, children who were excelling, who were doing well. They could do even better with this. That our resources should be targeted towards the gifted and not those who are struggling. Word of the program spread. There were parents from different parts of British Columbia who heard about the Vancouver Infant Program and wanted that for themselves. So the association helped them to start their own, modeled on Vancouver's. By 1975, there were five programs operating in BC. In Victoria, the government was noticing. Just a generation before, B. Purdy had been fighting tooth and nail to get a proper school. This time, it was the provincial government who came calling. They were excited by the potential and asked me if I would take on the role of provincial coordinator and help develop the service through the province. The program continued to thrive right where it all started, under the local direction of the association. And Dana took the government up on their offer. Within a short time, I was working with 20 infant programs in BC. By the time Dana retired in 2010, the program had been established in over 100 communities all over the province. In terms of the number of families served, it would be easily over uh, 120,000. And it had been adopted around the country and internationally. The key to the infant program and the success of it was the environment that was created by DDA. 
culture of innovation. Absolutely. That same culture of innovation back in the mid-60s had inspired the experimental daycare at UBC for three- to five-year-olds, which in the mid-1970s became a pioneering permanent daycare for special needs children, another first. Ideas about the potential of children with developmental disabilities were slowly changing. You know, the world is full of wonderful sights and sounds for youngsters, including the mentally retarded. Like my friend here, Bobby Gregg. Sure, he has a handicap, even though you may not notice it immediately. But like other children, he can learn a lot just by watching and doing. Want to get involved? Want to change things? Your local association for the mentally retarded can tell you how. Even before the mid-1970s, the world had been changing. for freedom and equality. The civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s Wrongs are inflicted on Negro citizens they are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice had many people thinking about who gets fundamental rights The right to be treated as a human being and who doesn't All men are born with the right of freedom human dignity Freedom! Freedom! Freedom now! And families who hadn't institutionalized their children were planting the seeds of a community living movement, envisioning a world without institutions. What was to become the DDA led the way in figuring out how such a world could work. Back in 1970, they set out to open a group home for adults. For many people, the mentally disabled are still an unknown and frightening group. People are worried they might hurt themselves or some other members of society. Might be aggressive, the property values might decrease. The only real solution is education. Do the people have any right to obstruct the civil rights of the mentally retarded? Approval from Richmond Council was a huge victory laying the groundwork for many more group homes. But despite the innovations happening, by the mid-70s, there was a third institution in BC. And conditions at the institutions hadn't improved much, even as a new, more idealistic generation started joining the staff at places like Woodlands. I worked at Woodlands for 14 years. I came in really young. And I remember there was a children's ward. So I come onto the ward, you know, new college kid, right? You know, meeting everybody. And the kids were four or five up to teens. And I noticed that a lot of the children didn't have front teeth. I'm told that's a biter, that's a biter, that's a biter. What would happen was is that if you were a biter, your teeth are removed, right? And you're just like, oh my God, oh my God. And so you start to think, what is actually going on? But when you realize that the prevalence of abuse is extraordinarily high, it's extraordinarily high for people with disabilities, period. Higher for people with developmental disabilities extremely high with people living in an institutional setting. Their teeth are the only thing that they have. They don't have weapons, right? Who are they going to cry to? You have that status quo of, I don't see it, I don't know it, I don't believe it. So if somebody goes to hurt them, right, or abuse them, or they have to self-defend, they do what they know best, they bite. Once those teeth are gone, now what?
I also recognized that to make changes was difficult. So how were you going to make a change? I was this young college student and people were adverse to any sort of suggestions. There was a lot of hostility, there was a lot of isolation, and I realized very quickly they wanted me to fall in line. You don't ask a lot of questions, but you learn to follow very, very quickly. And I, I personally learned you make a change with the small things that you say and do. On the outside, changes at the association are anything but small. All designed to integrate people with developmental disabilities deeper into the community and further enrich their lives. Vocational programs now employ more than 250. And more and more people are being provided supportive housing that meets their particular needs. Group homes. Semi-independent homes. And independent apartments with regular limited support. As time goes on, news of alternatives to institutionalization even penetrates the walls of the institutions themselves. I used to listen to talk radio. Say your piece. These people have an opportunity to live in the community. And there would be people that would talk about what it was like in the community. How can they do it? How come they're not here? And it really gave me hope. Wow, these guys are courageous. And I started reading about them. And I started reading about how some of these trailblazers were doing it every day. Wow, give people autonomy and choice and let people live in homes and have activities and to be happy and healthy. And it inspired me. It gave me hope. But... Was I burnt out? Absolutely. Hated my job, hated coming in every day because you were working in such an abusive, uh, degrading environment. It has an impact on you too as a person. Then, in 1981, years of lobbying finally pay off. The provincial government declares it will close all institutions for people with developmental disabilities. The government made a commitment in its own speech, which was great because it was a public commitment. One of my roles as assistant deputy minister was to provide the oversight of the whole downsizing deinstitutionalization project on behalf of government, right? We knew it would take several years. It wasn't going to be a two or three year thing. It was going to take 10 to 12 years at least to make it happen, right? I was working very closely with the government on the whole process of deinstitutionalization. How practically were we going to do this? Challenges were immense, really, because it was a huge project. So systemically, just the mechanics of how we were going to make it happen. There were still over 1,500 people living in institutions. Judy's sister wasn't one of them. Her family had rescued her from Woodlands years before. She went on from Woodlands into a uh, supportive group home situation. And she just, she, she blossoms in the community environment. She's got a great sense of humor. She's very generous. She's very loving and she gives the best hugs in the whole world. So that experience informed me as we went through the, uh, the process of deinstitutionalization. Judy was the head of the umbrella organization representing all of the community associations in BC. DDA 
had been the first. And now there were over 90 all over the province. I relied on, on DDA as a, as a provincial executive director, not to the exclusion of others, but they did play I would, a major leadership role. Like if you just look at their history, DDA started their first group home in the early 70s. So there had been 10 years of this sort of development. So it was key. They were demonstrating by example. But this was a massive initiative. There were a whole bunch of different issues that had to be managed. The whole vision from, from the beginning was not to dump people out there. They needed alternative residential care. And they needed support services to that residential care. There was a, an incredible planning process. You know, whether it be health or nursing or recreation or food, shelter, clothing, virtually transfer everything. It's one thing to say we're going to close them. It's another thing also to get people on board. Consternation in neighborhoods, that sort of thing, right? But there was a lot of public education. The Woodlands Parent Group, for example, some just wanted Woodlands fixed a bit. Others wanted it demolished. A lot of families didn't want the institutions to close because they felt, you know, there's danger in community. You had to keep the cabinet on board, the treasury board on board. But they could always point to those examples. The community associations, such as DDA, they were already demonstrating that all this could be done, that people could, in fact, live in supported environments. For some, getting there was going to be an arduous journey. There was this opportunity to actually get people ready for the community. But I was astonished. You have to start so base when you live in an institution. We had to start off really, really basic. Okay, we're gonna go out now. I need you to open the door to go out. They're all staring at you. Don't know what to do. They're all looking at you. They're waiting for you to open the door. A lot of the basic things that you would learn as a child and moving on up through your life stages, the people, the residents, didn't have those opportunities. They didn't learn that. So now there's a door handle. I need you to turn the door handle to come through the door. But we had to actually teach them how do you do that and what to do to walk through that door. The world that they are transitioning to is gradually becoming a different place. After a hard fight in 1982, people with disabilities had been included in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the world seems to finally be catching up with the association. The pioneering Oak Ridge School has been absorbed by the school board as special needs classes start appearing in regular schools. Then, the association's child care centers innovate again by becoming truly inclusive, welcoming all children. We have children here with special needs as well as those with typical needs, and everyone works and plays and learns together. With all the children, there's tremendous diversity, and so, uh, in order to bring community, we try and find what interests a particular child, and then we try and draw other children naturally into that play, and all have something to contribute. There are small classrooms of children, as opposed to one big room with 22 children in it. So the children get more individual attention. They're, and what's nice about the idea of integration is that the children that don't have special needs are here as role models. And that's what happens in the music group. You see the typical children modeling for the children with special needs so that the children with special needs can learn. Not only do they have the early childhood education, um, but they also have uh, special training in educating children with special needs. And as a parent of a child with special needs, I find it very comforting that my son is getting the modeling of the typical children, but he doesn't stand out. He doesn't stand out as being really different from all the rest of the children.
By the late 1980s, the association has a new name, is offering even more housing and day programs to meet the increasing need. And a new division of the association, Jobs West, facilitates employment out in the community. Through a careful process of screening, job matching, training, placement, and follow-up, many handicapped people find rewarding careers. And employers report that Jobs West candidates are reliable, hardworking, and safety-conscious employees. The association even has a restaurant. It was Canada's first commercial licensed restaurant dedicated to provide training for jobs in the food industry. People who had once been hidden away are now out in the public eye. But remarkably, the last of the eugenics era laws in Canada stayed on the books until 1986. The mentally handicapped have won a big victory in the Supreme Court of Canada. In a unanimous decision, the court says that where there is no medical reason, the mentally handicapped cannot be sterilized against their will. Today's ruling is one of their biggest legal victories, and they wept with joy. For all the people who are in jeopardy of getting sterilized or whatever, that will help. The landmark ruling became known as the Eve decision, named after a woman whose mother had wanted her to be sterilized without her consent after she became romantically interested in a man. Eve wasn't at the Supreme Court, but her supporters because were. We, for so long, we haven't been respected, and now I think that we're fine. people oh. are, are getting to respect us as people first and not handicapped. The people well, aren't going to make up our minds for us. Today is the first day of finally being recognized as equal under the law. In 1992, the association celebrates its 40th anniversary. What had started around a kitchen table is now widely recognized as a powerful, positive agent of change. And as the world continues to change, we operate over 40 facilities and services in Vancouver and Richmond. The association's programs keep growing which enhance the growth, education, independence, and self-esteem of our participants. And as the association grows, so does the size of its staff. I applied for a position and was thrilled, thrilled to be accepted at DDA. So the first day, that I came to DDA, I was like, wow, they got these little houses and they're so cool. And then the community, and there's small numbers of people and everybody knows everybody by name. I, I felt so inspired to be able to do what I love and do it in a way that will uplift the individuals that I work and absolutely uplift me. By 1996, only a single institution remained in the province, Woodlands. Then, on October 21st, it was announced that the very last residents of Woodlands would be gone by the end of the day. Off I went to Woodlands with a bottle of champagne. The place where Judy Carter Smith and her mom had visited Judy's little sister so many years before was about to be totally and completely empty. And of course, Woodlands was in the U.S. and Mom lived in Burnaby. So on my way over to Woodlands, I stopped at um, Mom's. It was hard for me. Anyway, so she said when I was going down the stairs, she said, say goodbye to Woodlands for me. And it was just so powerful. The place was empty, the grounds were empty, everyone was gone. And it was a torrential rain, it was a dark and stormy night, you know, like so. So, cracked open the champagne. Goodbye, Woodlands. Goodbye, Woodlands. It 
we did it. We did it. It's empty. When the last of Woodlands was finally knocked down, the cheers came from survivors still healing from the scars left by institutionalization. But as the year 2000 approaches, people with developmental disabilities are out in the community, living rich, full lives. And increasingly, they were demanding a seat at the table with the continuing growth of a concept known as self-advocacy. Being a self-advocate is speaking for yourself. My voice is important. People with developmental disabilities decided that they wanted to speak for themselves and they wanted people to listen to them and understand that they know a lot more than you think and they know a lot more about their own life than you ever will. The organization needed to change and it needed to be about more than just a new name. It needed to be about things like governance. I really enjoyed being on the board. <laughs> I really enjoyed being on the board. I worked on transit issues and other issues. When I was on the board, they listened to me. The necessary change needed to be about listening, listening to individuals. And for one, it needed to be about work. This idea of individually driven services was rather new and a challenge to the whole sheltered workshop system because sheltered workshops by definition took in big contracts and sort of kept everybody busy. So what we did was we met with each individual who spent time at our sheltered workshops and we asked them what they wanted to do. In response, the sheltered workshops were closed in favor of more individualized options. People with developmental disabilities can do a lot of things. I make hot lunches for kids and daycares. I walk dogs for the SPCA. I clean and sterilize equipment for the Red Cross. We even made this commercial to tell you about it. Imagine what else we can do. Vocational changes alone were not enough. The change had to be woven right into the very fabric of the organization itself. What we wanted to do was meet with each individual that we supported and ask them what their interests were, what they liked, what they didn't like, and ask them what their goals are. And you get the whole agency behind them working toward their goals, to their vision for their own future. With over 1,500 individuals to track, it would mean managing a lot of information. Fortunately, there was something that could handle that much data. Computers. 500 megahertz, 8.4 gigabyte, 64 meg RAM, 17 inch monitor, keyboard, CD-ROM, plus a one year warranty. Now, all they needed was the right software. Problem solved, except for one thing. The software did not exist. It didn't, it didn't exist. So we created a computer program called Alchemist. From scratch. It would always take a human to really listen to each individual's desires. But by tapping into emerging technology, the program was capable of tracking needs, wants, and goals, helping to ensure that everything was focused on what the individual wanted for themselves. So it really is a tailor-made service for every individual that we support. <laughs> Thank you.
Today, the DDA maintains a person-first, individually-centered approach. You like it? Ah, oh, yes, yes. Touching countless lives in a multitude of ways. And it's all supported by a diverse staff of more than 500 employees, including many who started with an entry-level position and worked their way up. I'm an assistant director in residential and supported living. I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I love it. The world has changed since the association started. But look closely, and there are still reminders of how things once were. Over 3,000 people were buried here who lived at Woodlands. It's hard to be here. But I come here because it's about remembering what happened here. There's hardly anything at all to remember those people by. You don't see the date of birth, who they were, where they came from, you know, where they were born. Nothing of that is there. It just lists the name and died because those individuals are not worth it. They're not worthy. They don't count. They're marginalized, even in death. One more reminder what happened here. Life was hell. It was awful. They were abused. They were mistreated. And I think that it is important that we remember. Because if we don't, it could happen again. Why can't it happen again? So remember. Remember how it was and how it changed. Remember the innovations and the innovators. Remember the Bobby Purdy's. He had a good life and he was very popular. He would, he was enthusiastic, you know. He, Somebody make a chocolate cake. Oh, this is my favorite. You know, just full of, full of life. I'm so, so blessed to have had such a person in my life. Remember the little sisters. Barb was very fortunate because she, our family was with her the whole way. A lot of people didn't have that. It hasn't always been easy, even as a sister, believe me. <laughs> We've had our fights. <laughs> Remember the thousands of lives touched Thousands yet to come. There's always more we can do.